Hi, this is Thomas. Welcome to Algebra. Today's topic is functions. We have two equations on the whiteboard. One is a function and one is not. We're going to work through the analysis of both equations and then identify what characteristics of one equation means that it's a function and then look at the other equation and determine why that one isn't a function. So starting with y equals x squared, we can input values for x and result in or produce outputs for y. So let's do three outputs for x starting with 0. And x squared is 0. Our input is 0, our output is 0. Next, let's use the value of 2. And 2 squared is 4, which is our y output. And then finally, negative 2. Negative 2 squared is also 4. And we can graph the equation as a parabola. We can see that here in the bottom of the whiteboard. That's the graph of y equals x squared. Now in our second example, we have x equals y squared. So we'll start with a y input and then calculate the x output. Let's use the same values as we used in our first equation. Starting with 0, 0 squared is 0. If y is 0, x is 0. Now for 2, 2 squared is 4. Input of 2, output of 4. And for negative 2, we also have an x value of 4. And when we graph this equation, we have another parabola looks a bit different because it's sideways as opposed to opening up its opening to the right. Now which of these is a function which isn't? The first is a function and the second is not a function. And we can make this decision either looking at our input output tables or by looking at the graphs. In the input output tables, notice that in our function y equals x squared, anytime we have x, we drive or derive or calculate our y, and we see something interesting in the y's. We have two y's that are the same with the function. But when we look back to the x's associated with those y's, those x's are unique. So x of 2 leads to y of 4. x of negative 2 also leads to y of 4. We can have one x produce one y, a different x produce the same y, and that's okay. So the y's, the outputs can be repeated. As long as the inputs aren't, we have a function. Looking at the second equation, notice that we have a different scenario. In the x column, we have 4 two times and the related y's aren't the same. So whenever we see that by inputting into an equation we can produce more than one x value, we don't have a function. So looking at the table values we can identify which of these equations is a function based on identifying any repeating x's. If we have repeating x's we do not have a function. Now, looking at the graphs, we can perform what is referred to as the vertical line test. And visually evaluate whether an equation is a function based on the graph. If I draw a vertical line through the graph, which we'll now see in red, and I'll draw several vertical lines through each of the graphs, what we notice is that we only cross the graph one time. That indicates that we do have a function. Now in our second case, we really only need one line to show that we fail the vertical line test. Notice in this case that the vertical line crosses the curve in two places. When we cross with the vertical line test in more than one place, we fail the vertical line test. That's an indication that we do not have a function. So we've seen two ways to evaluate equations to determine whether an equation is a function. If x's repeat when we have a table of xy values, we don't have a function. If we only see one x in all of our calculations, 
1x can drive a y that we see repeated with other x's. But as long as the x's aren't repeated, we have a function. And then graphically, with the vertical line test, we can visually evaluate whether a curve is a function. Now let's look at some function terminology and notation. We refer to the inputs of a function as the function's domain, and we refer to the resulting outputs as the function's range. And we'll continue to work with our identified function y equals x squared. In function notation, we can write this as f of x equals x squared, or function f such that x maps onto x squared. Now in set notation, we can notate the inputs as x values such that x is an element of the real numbers. In other words, we can put any real value in for x, positive, negative, zero, even irrational, as a possible input into this function. Now when we consider the outputs, let's think about the possible outputs of y. y such that y is greater than or equal to 0. y will not ever be negative when we're squaring x. So the smallest y can be is 0. So y such that y is greater than or equal to 0, and y is an element of the real numbers. So in this function we see a restriction on the range. Let's look at an example with a restriction on the domain. Let's take the function f of x equals the square root of x minus 3. So in this case our domain will have a restriction. x values such that x is greater than or equal to 3. Otherwise, we'll have a negative value under the radical, thus we have a restriction. The x must be greater than or equal to 3, and with that restriction, x is an element of the real numbers. And the resulting range, y is such that y Let's think about what our result is going to be. What we've done is we've essentially created an input such that the result will never be a negative number. It could be 0, but it will never be negative. So y is greater than or equal to 0. And again, y is an element of the real numbers. So in both of our examples of Evaluating the domain and range of functions, we see that it's important to consider possible restrictions on either the domain or the range, or sometimes both, for a given function. This concludes part one of the lesson on functions. When we continue, we're going to look at the concepts of composite functions and inverse functions.